Welcome. Uh, I want to introduce a couple of dignitaries while we're here. Professor uh, Howard Schneider, who is the Dean of the School of Journalism, started the My Life As lectures almost as soon as he arrived on campus. And we have been producing these since October of 2006. We launched with Bob Woodward, the Watergate investigative reporter at the Washington Post. This will be the 39th My Life As event, which makes me feel kind of old. I didn't realize we'd done that many. So, Dean Schneider, will you stand up and wave? And So the purpose, for those of you who haven't been to one of these before, the purpose of the My Life As lecture series is twofold. One, for the non-journalism students in the crowd. For the non-journalism students, we want to give you a chance to see some of these concepts we've discussed in the news literacy class, sort of up close and personal. What, how does that really work in somebody's life? You know, Professor Baldhead is up there waving his arms about all these great things journalists do. What does a journalist say about that? And the second thing that we try to do is to give you some idea about how does a person go about choosing a career or finding a calling? Because the speakers we bring tend to be fairly passionate about what they do. And I know that at a college campus, we're all trying to figure out, as I said today in lecture, what are we going to be when we grow up? So I hope you learned some life lessons tonight. The other is that we expect, we expect journalism students to benefit from meeting and seeing people that they look up to and hope to uh, emulate. So just a couple of lessons, a couple of announcements. Number one, credit is granted in news literacy for students who swipe their ID cards through the little gadget on the way out. Please silence your cell phones and put them out of sight. You know how I am about that. Uh, the ideal duration of a My Life As evening is about an hour and 15 minutes, so we're going to move expeditiously along. Our guest will give a short autobiography, and then we'll move her over to the hot seat for a little conversation and question and answer. And then the third and most important part of the evening is Q&A, and they are your questions for the speaker. We will have two wireless mics um, being hand-delivered by staff from the School of Journalism, so just wave your hand for it, and don't be shy. It really gets more interesting when the students ask the questions. OK. Weeks after 9-11, our guest traveled immediately, what would you do, to the Afghan outback to cover the US-led battle against the Taliban, which she covered for the Boston Globe and San Francisco Chronicle. By 2003, she was covering the invasion of Iraq for US News and World Report, and she helped establish and run their bureau in Baghdad until February of 05. Leaving Iraq, she returned to Russia, the homeland of her parents, which they fled under persecution by Soviet bureaucrats. She crisscrossed Europe for a series about corporate espionage. She followed George Bush's outspoken under Secretary for Public Diplomacy, Karen Hughes, through Morocco. Ilana Ozernoy has spent the last decade working as a reporter for print, radio, and online outlets. Her work has appeared in US News and World Report, The Atlantic, <clears throat> The New Republic Online, Dispatches Quarterly, Newsweek, and Marie Claire. She's also produced work for CNN, NPR, and Marketplace, which is a Public Radio International franchise. In January, she joined the faculty of the School of Journalism here at Stony Brook, where she is teaching advanced reporting and online journalism while she finishes a book about being a very American child of very Russian parents. Please join me in welcoming Ilana Ozernoy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Miller, and um, thank you, Dean Schneider, for inviting me to speak here. Thank you, all of you, for coming out on Valentine's Day. Hello, Valentines. All right. So this is where 
I was from. This is a building that stands in the center of Moscow on Arjunikidze Street, number 14. It was named in honor of Sergo Arjunikidze, who in 1924, in the span of eight days, executed 12,578 people. He later told the Central Committee of the Communist Party that, well, maybe we did go a little too far, but we just couldn't help ourselves. I say that this is where I was from because um, this is a world that no longer belongs to me. These two lovely people are my parents, Marianne and Leonid. Um, they brought me into the world in 1978. And in the same year, they decided that our family would leave this country, Russia. Um, the legend in my family goes that they actually named me after a Voice of America reporter. My mom heard um, someone speaking on the radio named Alana. And my father said, this is the year that we're going to go to America. And so they named me Alana. And they applied to immigrate, and they were refused. Um, my father was uh, fired. He was an astrophysicist. He taught at Moscow State University, and he also did research. He was allowed to continue doing research, but he was no longer allowed to teach because this was considered an ideological post, and someone who wanted to leave the Soviet Union was considered a traitor. My mother, who worked at the Pushkin Museum of Fine Art, was also fired. So our life changed very dramatically um, just for wanting to leave. Um, there's a term for people like us. We were called refuseniks. Uh, it's a term that um, applies to people who tried to leave the Soviet Union and were refused and then punished for trying. Uh, but I like to think that we were called refuseniks because we refused. We refused to live in a, on a street named in honor of a mass murderer. And we refused to live in a world in which scientists were not allowed to cooperate with their colleagues um, internationally, in which reporters weren't allowed to write about the world that they saw. And a world in which people were imprisoned for their thoughts and for their conscience. My parents refused all of this. And, um, and for that, they were, they were punished. This is my father on hunger strike. He went on his first hunger strike in 1981. Uh, this was the year, two, year or two and a half years after we first applied to leave the Soviet Union. Um, we didn't hear anything back. You know, my, I remember um, going to the Ministry of Immigration and waiting to hear whether or not we were actually going to be able to leave. And there was just no answer. There was silence for two and a half years. And then finally, one day my parents were told that immigration is inexpedient. I'm not really sure what this means. Uh, we never really figured it out. But my father went on a hunger strike in 1981 and then again in 1983 to protest um, the fact that we weren't allowed to leave Russia, that we couldn't be reunited with our family. My grandmother had immigrated to San Francisco. And there were a lot of people, a lot of scientists especially, who got involved in trying to get us out. My father had been invited to come to Harvard. And uh, there was a man who ran the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, George Field, who got really involved in trying to get us out. Um, I remember... I mean, it's, it's very hard to imagine this world now. Um, this was the Cold War. This is the early 80s. Um, there was no internet. There was um, really no information. I mean, the only way we really knew what to expect, I remember that my parents would say, on Soviet television, we would see reports of America, and it would always be shown in bad weather, like it was always raining, or there'd be, you know, 
because it's, you know, life in America was really bad. And, um, and I remember my parents saying, well, it must be really sunny over there, because why else would the Soviets try to show us that it's really bad? Um, but really, the way that we survived, I mean, these sorts of actions, my father going on hunger strike, he lost 13 pounds in the span of eight days. And because we had journalists coming to our house and writing about his actions, um, and people in America and other parts of the world who were concerned about our fate and who wanted to help us to get out, our survival really depended on this. If it wasn't for that, um, anything could have happened to us. I mean, growing up, I remember we were followed and photographed by the KGB. I have memories of vans being parked outside our house with big microphones sticking. I mean, this is kind of like spy stuff, but um, it was also my life. And it was because people risked their life and risked their well-being to come to our house, to hear our message, and then carry it out um, behind this big wall that surrounded us. That was really, um, in the end, I think, what helped us to get out. Um, they also brought us things in. Um, I remember when I first got my first Barbie. Uh, it was a really big moment. I mean, it was the Soviet Union. There was no such thing as a Barbie. And I remember that it was contraband. Um, this wasn't something that I could bring outside and play with because in my world, I couldn't tell anyone that we wanted to immigrate to America. I couldn't tell anyone that my father was on hunger strike. I couldn't tell anyone except people who were diplomats or reporters uh, what it was like to live in our house. And thinking about that now, um, you know, I was asked to come here to speak about what led me to become a journalist or how I became a reporter. And I know that not all refuseniks are reporters and certainly not all reporters were refuseniks, but these definitely were the things that influenced me growing up, this idea that we were stuck in this dark room behind this great wall and there were people who could come in and bring Barbie dolls and M&Ms and hubba bubba bubble gum and hear our story and take our message out into the world and help us. So this is who was in charge while I was growing up. And looking back now, I mean, everything, of course, is in hindsight. It seems inevitable that the Soviet Union was going to fall. It seems inevitable that these changes were going to take place. And yet, at the time, it felt to us like, you know, the Thousand Year Reich. I mean, that this was just going to keep happening, and the world was changing, and there was glossness and perestroika, and people were talking about um, the Beatles and jeans and Levi's and all these things. All these changes were taking place. But we still couldn't leave. We still couldn't get out of Russia. We were still stuck on the inside. And the more changes took place, the more the world began to feel that the Soviet Union was um, becoming more liberal, more democratic, the more scared my parents became that the Soviets had just duped everyone and the world was going to move on and leave us behind. And then there really would be no recourse. There would be no helping us. So my father began to plan a very, very big demonstration. And uh, he began taking more and more risks. And in the meantime, uh, the Committee for Concerned Scientists and other people in the international community, scientists and George Field at Harvard, um, were also working much more energetically to try to get us out. And as it happened, Senator Edward Kennedy was coming to Moscow. and. He had a list of 25 families, and our name was on that list. And then our name was not on the list. And then our name was back on the list by some random act of some anonymous person. And uh, he went to Moscow, and he met with Gorbachev, and he gave him the list. And the next thing we knew, we were kicked out and uh, moved to America and embraced freedom. So 
This is the man who was in charge when we left, and this is the man who was in charge when I went back. Um, <laughs> in 2001, um, 15 years after my family immigrated from Russia, I was eight years old at the time of our immigration, and this is now, I'm 23 years old, I've just graduated from college, and I've decided I really want to be a writer, I really want to be a journalist, I really want to become like one of those people who came to our house when I was little um, and brought me Barbie dolls. So, um, so I decide, I announce to my family, I'm, I'm going back, I'm going back to Moscow. Which, looking back on it now, I really understand how hard that must have been for my parents. But back then, all I remember thinking is, you know, I was 23 and it just, it seemed to me like everyone around me knew something that I didn't. And I just, I remember thinking that if I could somehow go back and recapture the story that should have been mine and heal the wound of history, that I would somehow become whole again, that I would somehow recapture all of this information that belonged to me that everyone else knew and I didn't. And you know, growing up in America, my parents really didn't talk about Russia. I mean, this is kind of a very classic immigrant story. We left, we broke with the old country, the old country betrayed us, it was evil, and we would never go back. We were told we could never go back. In fact, they took away our passports when we left. So for my parents, it was really, you know, this big life change based on really just an idea, right? They'd never been to America, they'd never seen it for themselves and they had to survive. And so in order to survive in America and, and deal with all the difficulties of being immigrants and the struggle of being um, you know, always one step behind and never quite understanding the joke, my parents told us that Russia was a bad place and no matter what bad things happened in America, things would always be worse in Russia. But I couldn't accept that narrative. I couldn't accept that myth for me there was this whole country that I was watching on the news changing completely. Moscow seemed to me like, I don't know, what I imagined Weimar Republic was in the 1920s, you know, spinning, luminous, bright, these dazzling lights, cabarets and casinos, all these changes taking place, BMWs and sushi bars and just a whole world completely upturned and, and in, in constant flux and change and I wanted to see it. I wanted to feel it, I wanted to be there, and, and I wanted to go home. I really wanted to go home. And I just thought, you know, I'll get there and I will figure it out. Well, as it turned out, it was a very long time before I figured out anything. But um, I did figure out a few things, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So as Professor Miller said, I went to Afghanistan weeks after 9-11. Um, I had gone back to Russia. I had, um, you know, I'd never written before, but I basically went around and I just knocked on the door of every news organization, every English language news, news organization, and I, I speak Russian, so I said, you know, let me sweep your floor, I can do it bilingually. <laughs> and, and it worked, I mean, really, I got, you know, some reporting assignment here and there, and um, I was going to go back to grad school for journalism, but um, I really, when I, when I spoke with other journalists, when I spoke with people who were already working in the profession, I just, I kept hearing over and over, you know, one way to become a journalist certainly is to go to grad school, but then there's this whole other way, which is that you just go somewhere and you, you just, you show up and you start working. And this seemed kind of crazy to me. Um, but I, I kept hearing so many people, people who had gotten their start in places like Bosnia and even going back to Vietnam, people who had just gone and set up shop as a freelancer. And they said to me, you know, find a story in the news that has legs. Find a story that is bound to be on the front page um, for a prolonged period of time. Find a story that not everyone is going to be covering. Find a story where a reporter is likely to go on a vacation or someone's going to get sick or someone's going to need your help to take over and just stay. And so when 9-11 happened and I remember, you know, 
trying to, I went down to, to ground zero and I had this slightly less than legal press card. And <laughs> I, um, I went around trying to report and I, and I just got nowhere because everybody had somebody in ground zero. So I turned around, I turned around, I got on the next plane out going that way and I went back to Moscow and from there I planned to go to to Dushanbe, uh, which is the northeastern corridor going into Afghanistan. And on October 7th, 2001, the day that uh, the US launched uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, ironically enough, I called my father from the airport and I said, um, I'm getting on a plane and I'm gonna go write about this war. And my father, who was a, you know, who had once been this human rights activist, this um, political dissident, this leader, um, you know, he he had done all those things because he he didn't want me to go through the same kind of struggles. He wanted me to have a very different kind of life. And despite this background, and despite all of these things that I witnessed as I was growing up, you know, really what I was told in my family was that you know, I should become a lawyer or a doctor, or, um, do something traditional, something um, close to home, and um, something that I would never have to struggle or never have to feel insecure in my, in, my in my line of work. And so when I said to my father, oh, guess what, I'm going to Afghanistan to cover Operation Enduring Freedom, my father said, I forbid you to go. Uh, at which point I said, you can't forbid me, I'm 23. <laughs> And he said, you don't know what you're doing. And I hung up the phone. And this was the first lesson that I learned. Um, this was a really hard lesson because I spent that whole plane ride in tears. And the reason that I spent it in tears is because I'm very close with both of my parents. You know, I come from a very small family and we went through a lot together. And um, it was really hard for me to do something that my parents didn't approve of. It was really hard for me. I mean, when I went back to Russia, they didn't exactly approve of it, but they didn't tell me not to go. You know, my mother said, like, you know, you'll get arrested, or, you know, people think you're a spy. It's really dangerous. She warned me against it, but she didn't say flat out, don't go. And this was an act of, of rebellion. I mean, this was an act of emancipation. This was... This was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. And I just, I remember sitting in the, in the airplane saying to myself, you're not responsible for your parents' happiness. You're not responsible for your parents' happiness. And that stayed with me, that, that idea. And, um, that would probably be the, the first thing that I, wanna, that I wanna tell you, the students of Stony Brook. Now, I don't, I don't want this to be misconstrued because I don't, it's not to say that you need to make your parents miserable um, but it means that every person has the right to, to realize themselves, to fulfill themselves. No one sees what you see for yourself. No one can tell you what you're supposed to be doing with your life, and a life spent trying to live up to the expectations of others is an unhappy life. It's an unfulfilled life. Um, you have to figure out what you want to do, and you only have one chance in this life to do it. So why, why would you live a life of regret? So that's what I did. I decided to realize myself. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't go by way of donkey. But, um, but I, I went by... Uh, I went, I, went, I got in a, I basically got in a Jeep. I got in a Jeep and I, um, I pushed towards the front lines and I had never written a news story before I did it, but I just really believed that I would, that I would just be able to do it. Um, I heard recently someone say that um, success in life is not about talent, it's about certainty. So if you lack talent, have no fear, all you need is just to be really certain, just to really believe that 
um, that you'll do it, that you can do it. So that's what I did. I got in a, I got in a car and I, it sounds kind of crazy in hindsight and sometimes I, I wonder if that was really me. And I pushed my way towards the front lines and I cold called every news organization in America and I um, got a lot of rejection. I got a lot of no's. A lot of people said I was crazy. And I certainly made a lot of mistakes along the way. But I, I, I just kept trying. And this is the second thing I want to um, share with you, the second lesson I learned uh, in this last decade of my life, is you just don't take no for an answer. Um, rejection is not personal. And all it takes is one yes. Just remember that all it takes is one yes. You will hear a lot of people say no, but you just need one person to say yes. And for me, that person was some editor on the foreign desk of the Boston Globe who picked up the phone just at the right moment, and I had perfected my pitch to him, and I, there had been some news that day. Um, bomb had fallen on the wrong side of the front lines, and. I pitched him the story, and he literally said, just, he didn't even get my name. He said, yeah, 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 send me 700 words. And he hung up the phone. And that was my first assignment. That was my first story. And it um, miraculously ran on the front page of the Boston Globe, um, which kind of made me lose a little respect for the Globe, because I thought, don't they know? Her? <laughs> this can't be right. Afghanistan. I spent three months in Afghanistan. I wrote for the Boston Globe and the San Francisco Chronicle, and eventually I got an assignment with U.S. News and World Report covering the fall of Kabul. And it was it was incredible. I mean, it was reporting is really a young person's game. You know, had I become a lawyer, I would have been filing reports to my superiors after having spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in grad school. Had I become a doctor, I would be doing rotations and cleaning up throw up. I was 23 years old, and I was writing the same kinds of stories that people who were 10, 15, 30 years older than me were doing. And it was incredible. I mean, the, the sense of self, you, you know, the sense of realization that you feel when you are out on these stories and you're reporting and you're talking to people. I often hear people, you know, talk about war correspondents as adrenaline junkies. But here's the thing, adrenaline, yes, it's a huge, huge, massive rush of adrenaline, but it doesn't come from being shot at. The adrenaline rush that you feel comes from being on the front lines of history and witnessing these amazing events that people will write about in history books, the events that really define our life, our time, seeing them for yourself and talking to the people who are involved in them and, and, and transporting their stories out into the world. That, for me, that was the most amazing adrenaline rush. I still remember this day. I remember riding into Kabul literally two hours after the Taliban had fled, hanging on the back of an open-air taxi. I remember how that felt. And I just, I wanted to keep doing it. My first story that ran in a magazine, I did a book after my three months in Iraq. I mean, all of these things, you know, I just, I can't imagine any other job that would have allowed me to do these things. And then two years later, U.S. News uh, sent me to Baghdad. And I got there on this day when Saddam's statue was toppled. And as uh, Professor Miller said, I stayed on for two years and uh, helped set up the bureau and every day got to push myself a little further and test my boundaries a little more. This is my room at the Palestine. I have this here because people often think that reporters lived in the green zone, but it's not true. We lived in the red zone, which is the rest of Iraq. And this is my hotel room, and this is the view um, onto Paradise Square. 
I missed shock and awe. I was in Jordan for that, waiting on the border to get into Iraq. But I didn't miss this. This is Fallujah in 2004. Uh, this was the biggest, most devastating military operation that took place after the invasion. And I had been in Iraq uh, about a year and a half when it took place. And I was really tired, but I had the sense that uh, it was important for me to be there. And through a series of steps, I found myself in the middle of the battlefield. And this is the third thing that I learned and want to share with you. People often ask me if I was scared. And it's a funny thing because I, I think maybe young people feel fear in a different way. Like when I was 13, I'd watch these movies like The Exorcist and Chucky and I would never watch any of that. Is that my bell? <laughs> Time to cut it off. I'm almost done. Um, when you're young, when you're 23, 24, 25, you think nothing is irrevocable. You think everything is in front of you. You think, what's the big deal? I'll go to a war zone. So what? If I screw it up, I'll just do something else. I had this B plan in my head for the first three years I worked as a war correspondent. I deferred my graduate school uh, enrollment. And I just kept calling them year after year saying, will you take me back if I come back next year? And you know, I just had this idea that if it doesn't work, I'll just do something else. But what I learned is that you can't start over. There's no such thing as starting over. There are fresh starts, but the things that you do, the actions that you take, the person that you become, your history, these are the things that will define you. And you have to learn to live with who you were. My father, uh, died in 2002, 10 years this month. And two weeks before he passed, he called me into his room and he said, I want to talk to you. And he told me that as a parent, he couldn't condone what I had done. He couldn't approve of it. But as a fellow human being, he was proud of me. He was proud of me that I had found something in my life that I believed in so much that I would defy even my parents, his words, to do it. And just thinking about it now, this year, you know, I thought that what I had done was this, this big rebellion, this big act of emancipation, uh, charting my own path and making my own way into the world and not following in my parents' footsteps. But in fact, I think um, I am my father's daughter. You know, he was driven by big questions. You know, who are we? Why are we here? How did we get here? And these are the questions that have defined my career, my life as a journalist. So the other thing that you've witnessed tonight is a sea change in the school of journalism. Because that was some remarkably spare writing, was it not? You know, okay, I and Howie tend to go as fast as we can go and pack as much in, and that was really different. And I just, as a writer, I wanted to say that was really an interesting, different delivery, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, would you make your pitch? 
for me? My pitch. You're standing there. This bomb's gone off on the wrong side. Let me hear the pitch. I'm the guy <laughs> on the other side of the phone. Say who? 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 Who's this? What? What? Um, um, hello? My name is Alana Osernoy. Who? And I'm in Jabal Siraj. And <laughs> Where? Please, please give me an assignment. Please. So what, I mean, literally, how do you do that? You're 23 and you make this pitch to somebody who doesn't want to hear from you. All it takes is one. You know, I just, I had, I had traveled. I had spent two weeks on this crazy road through the Hindu Kush mountains. It's a 13,000 foot precipitous drop. Um, riding in a, in a Jeep, which we discovered halfway had no brakes. <laughs> Um, my 14-year-old Afghan driver was downshifting, to, <laughs> and, um, you know, we drove through, I mean, this is now I'm going to sound like a war correspondent, but we literally drove through dust storms and mountains and white water, and it was, it was, it was, there was no going back. There was, there was no going back for me. I would just observe you don't sound like a war correspondent. You are a war correspondent. <laughs> We've been in our household watching this debate about the woman at the top of Google. And the New York Times has described her success as a product of luck. And there were some complaints about it. And then somebody went back and did content analysis. And in similar stories about men, they never say luck. I mean, numerically, they don't. It was a really interesting study. Which brings me to my question. You and I were talking about this last week. You wanted to be known as a woman of courage. <laughs> Talk about that a little bit. A woman of courage. I don't know if I wanted to be known as a woman of courage. I think I wanted to be brave. Um, I think women aren't often asked to be brave. And this isn't something that typically a woman is asked to do. We're asked a lot of things. Um, but this isn't something that you are raised to become. And it's funny, I mean, also being a writer or a journalist, uh, it's a profession that's a very hard road that no one asks you to go on. And I think that's why a lot of people call it a calling, because you really have to feel something from the inside. You really want to want it badly to do it. Um, and so I wanted to do that. I wanted to write and I wanted to be a journalist, but I, I also wanted to test myself. I wanted to know what it felt like to, to walk into fire and, and, and come out unscathed. And it wasn't really until Fallujah that I realized just how stupid that is. Mm -hmm. um, when were you the most scared when you were covering these conflicts? Fallujah. Mm -hmm. Fallujah. I, I think by then it was a combination of things. I had um, spent maybe five years working as a war correspondent full time. I had been traveling that whole time and uh, I was tired. But it was also, uh, you know, these places like in Afghanistan, I mean, I showed this picture where there's this man laughing and it's interesting how people relate to death in Afghanistan. Um, you know, we would be walking down to the front lines and we'd have some bullets fired at us from across the way by the Taliban and the Afghans would laugh. They would laugh and they would hop across the open space and they'd keep going and there was a kind of, I mean, I think they were just so used to war um, and it happened so sporadically that one could just laugh it off. One could just sort of go, okay, well, I'm scared in the moment, but then it's over and it's okay. Um, and the same with Iraq, you know, in Baghdad for two years living in Baghdad, I was living in a hotel, as I said, I wasn't in the green zone. And the thing about Baghdad is that the war was, was everywhere, and it was nowhere. You could land in Baghdad, get into your car, drive down the street, and you would see people walking down having ice cream or washing their cars. You'd see school children in pressed uniforms running to classes, and then you'd turn the corner and there would be a tank or concertina wire, or a death squad going around um, taking people out, literally just, you know, sectarian violence. And 
again, you could hide from it. You could go back to your hotel. You could tell yourself that if you take this road or go by that road or do this or hire a chase vehicle or, you know, there were a number of steps that one took to feel in control. And it was, and you could control it. And so the moments that you were scared were, again, these kind of isolated incidents. And then I got to Fallujah and it was just full on, nonstop, unrelenting violence, just blood everywhere. There was blood on the soldiers and there was blood on me and I would wake up in the middle of the night to rocket fire and I wouldn't know if it was incoming or outgoing and then I would see these soldiers, these boys, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old boys come back from the battlefield wounded, get patched up and hobble out again. It, it was horrible. It was really just the most devastating thing I'd ever seen. And then this moment came where, um, you know, I followed a commander out into uh, Fallujah proper. You know, we would go in every single day. We would get into an armed personnel carrier. The APC would drive us into the city. We would get out and we would watch them go door to door. And uh, and we got, we got, so we got pinned by sniper fire and we got pinned down by sniper fire for a very long time. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how long, it, I have no recollection of the time because it all just happened in, in a breath, but in the longest breath I'd ever taken. And at some point, um, we're sitting there crouching and these soldiers are standing over us and you know, you, you're a reporter, you don't have a gun. Um, you're relying on these people to protect you and I have to pee. <laughs> and you know, we're there for hours and I'm terrified. I'm just so scared and I, I'm 25 years old and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, how did I get here? It all made sense to me. You know, my father, the immigration, the political dissidents, the, you know, making, you know, emancipation, becoming, you know, all these things, all these steps that I took, always looking forward, always running towards the next thing, and suddenly it all adds up and I'm crouching on a emptied street in the middle of a war zone and this soldier is standing over me with a M6, literally guarding me as I squat to urinate. <laughs> it was the most humbling thing that has ever, I mean, it was the most just, it really woke me up. I had to ask someone to stand over me with a gun while I peed. Is that a turning point? Is that a moment where you, something changed? I think so. I, I, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's funny because hindsight, again, in, 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 in memory, you always, your, your mind, the way it works is it organizes all these events and compartmentalizes them. And so I associate that moment as the moment in which, I mean, I definitely remember what it felt like to squat and, and just, I was just, I hated myself. I, I hated myself for being there. And I just kept thinking, why aren't I back in Brooklyn, you know, in a bar like a normal 25 year old drinking beer, you know, why am I here? How did I get here? And I was, I was really, a lot of reporters talked about Fallujah as the breaking point. Um, it really was for a lot of people the breaking point because it was after having stayed in this country for two years it was then weeks of this unrelenting violence and uh, I, I stayed on after that for a, a few more months I covered the elections in 05 um, and then I went home on a break I had made staff by that point at US News and World Report I had become their you know a foreign correspondent and while I was home on break, my, my bureau blew up. Literally, uh, uh, I was staying, we had this, we had set up this bureau at the Alhambra Hotel and Suites in central Baghdad. It was a beautiful old hotel, sort of circa 1960s with this vaguely Ikea looking furniture. And we had a swimming pool and there was a Chinese restaurant that made chicken fried rice. And it was all very manageable to live there, but um, then suddenly this, this guy packed a bunch of explosives into a truck drove it right into the pool, and I had a beautiful suite overlooking the pool, of course, I had pool views, and my, and my bureau blew up. It just was no longer there, and so at that point, um, my editor said, you know, maybe we should cover some other stories for a while. Wow. So, 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 what difference does a war correspondent's work make, and to whom? What difference does a war correspondent 
Yeah, you're, you're reporting on this story. Um, you are thousands of miles away. A conflict that a marginal percentage of the American population really is paying the attention to. What did you feel like you were accomplishing by being there? What was the what was the purpose? Aside my own personal gratification. Yeah. Um, well, first, I mean, just to answer your first question, you know, I don't, I don't think I ever really thought of myself as a war correspondent, um, because again, all of these things kind of happened. You know, in hindsight, I can tell you the story very neatly how it all happened, how one thing led to another. But as I was going, you know, forward in the world, I really only saw myself going to the next place and the place after that, and. And so I really didn't think of myself as a war correspondent. I really thought of myself as a correspondent who happened to be covering war. And um, I had read a lot of Hemingway growing up. And so I think some part of me thought also that doing this kind of work would then lead naturally into a writing career. And so that was a part of it. Um, but what I wanted to accomplish was really that I wanted to see the world. You know, I, I, I think about this a lot, I still think about this. I think about how there's so many people out in the world. There's literally every single day, hundreds of thousands of people walk past me who I will never meet. And yet these people share something with me, right? They live on this earth at the same time as I do. And they will be witness to the same events. They will have the same history. This is the stuff that's happening under our watch. I wanted to see it. I wanted to tell people about it. Our watch being your, our gen, your generation. And your generation and mm -hmm. everyone who's alive, you know, everyone who's alive during 9-11 and everyone who's alive during the war in Afghanistan and the ongoing war in Afghanistan. And so a couple more questions before we open up to questions from the audience. One of them is we, I used the Proust uh, questionnaire. Proust wrote this great set of questions for getting to know people, and I use that with people who do these My Life As events. Um, one of the things you said that of all the virtues, you think doggedness is your favorite. What do you mean by that word, and why is doggedness your favorite virtue? I think I was, I, I, I was raised uh, to believe that perseverance and doggedness were, were really um, qualities that one, that really made life viable. I mean, my father for eight years was told that immigration was inexpedient. For eight years, I mean, I remember as a child, every month going with my mother to, this, to the ministry to Ovir to find out if this was the month I mean, eight years, every month, going to find out, are we going to be let out this time? And then one day, suddenly, we were. And it's always been this way. You know, there's, I sit here today, and I tell you the story, and it all seems, you know, like, wow, that happened. But, you know, there were so, so many steps along the way, which I faced rejection, or, or which people told me no, which people said, try again, kid, or better luck next time. I mean, you know, there's so many times where I just had to get up and do it again. And I really respect this quality in other people, I think, as well, because I, maybe I, I associate that with my father and I, um, I connect to it in some way. So maybe that's why I put it as my favorite virtue. So the students that are in news literacy right now and all the journalism students who suffered through it before they could become journalism majors, um, spent this part of the semester thinking about the First Amendment and freedom of the press, freedom of speech. And I wonder, you've sort of been on both sides of that divide. You know, you've been the person being written about, and you've been the person writing about people who are facing whatever it is they're facing. How do you think that experience of being on Bye. both sides uh, <laughs> How does that affect you as a journalist? The fact that you experienced yeah. being written about as well as writing about. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I, um, in doing the research, I've been doing research for this, well, I've now been writing this book, um, which 
is a, lo a lot of it is about my father and um, his activities as a dissident were, were all documented and cataloged uh, by the Committee of Concerned Scientists. And there were a lot of, as I said, journalists who had come into our house when I was growing up in Russia. And so some kind, anonymous person basically compiled all the articles written about my family, thing, you know, articles in the New York Times and Los Angeles Times and Washington Post, and put them all together in this file that I found at Columbia University a few years ago. And really, through that act and through that act of journalism, was able to learn things about my family that my parents never talked about because it was just too painful a thing for them to, to revisit. And it was very strange, um, you know, reading a story in the Washington Post by Mary McGrory, who was a columnist who visited us in Russia, and, wa and seeing myself in the story appear as a seven-year-old who flitted in and out of the room with tea and cakes. And then identifying that, like, oh, that's color, that's what, you know, <laughs> that's, like, the reporter in me had deconstructed that, like, oh, like, of course, I would have put the same thing in the story had I been her. Yeah. And it was really, it was a, it was a weird kind of, um, it's like a piece of theater, you know, and, 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 and it all comes full circle, because mm -hmm. we're all playing these roles, you know, my father playing the role of the dissident, and us playing the roles of the dissident who need the reporters, and then me growing up becoming a reporter and then going back to Russia and interviewing dissidents. And uh, yeah, the, the theatrical quality of it doesn't escape me, but I'm not quite sure what else to say about it. So I'm about to turn it over to you guys, so start thinking about your questions. The microphones are gonna circulate with Associate Dean of the Journalism School, Marcy McGinnis, and Liz Farley, who's a staff assistant at the Center for News Literacy. <laughs> While they're getting set up and you're figuring out your questions, I have one last question. Um, where next? You said you got into all this trouble because you wanted to see the world. Where would you go next and why? Where is Dean Schneider going to send me? <laughs> where do you guys want to go? Let's do some journalism without walls. Um, where next? Well, you know, I came to a crossroads at some point, right? I mean, I think there are very few moments in your life where you can really identify this fork in the road. Um, I came to that moment in, uh, in, at some point in my journalism career where I had really sort of, I think it was actually, this is a, a terrible thing to say, but I think this was the day that I made staff at US News and World Report because suddenly my life was not about just the next story and the next story after that. Suddenly I saw my life as a foreign correspondent working for this news organization and I pictured 20 years worth of stories and I had this image of myself, you know, looking, looking back at my photo album. There's Alana in front of a tank in Chechnya and there's Alana, you know, dodging bullets and and, and it was just, you know, that's not, you know, I, I didn't want to be a war correspondent. I didn't want to live a life based around other people's stories. I wanted to tell my story. And, and I, I wanted to, I mean, I, I wanted to teach. You know, my, both my parents were academics. And it's funny, it's, uh, despite all my rebellions and I, and I went, all the way to Iraq to get away from this legacy of my father only to come back and become the next Professor Ozernoy. So. <laughs> so let's take some questions from the students and the audience. Did you feel the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan accomplished anything and if so, what? And three hours later, they were still there. <laughs> <laughs> Put your feet up. Um, did they accomplish anything? Well, um, you know, growing up in the Soviet Union, and again, uh, this really influenced uh, the way that I felt about these wars because we lived in a, in a very closed world in which our very survival depended on the intervention of America. You know, my father, uh, by deciding to immigrate, put our life at risk and took a place of 
dissidents. Um, and this idea that, you know, someone like Ted Kennedy could come and rescue us, that someone like Reagan could influence Gorbachev, that there were democracies and free people in the world who had the power to free us and help us, this really, really influenced me. And so being 23 and also not knowing anything about the horror of war, um, I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. And especially, you know, today, you know, war, we're taught, is this sort of desynthesized thing. You know, it's precise. There are minimal casualties. A rocket is sent into a, t a television station in which there are no people. A telephone tower will go down, but there won't be anyone working there. You know, we're told that war is something that is mechanical and clean and quick, efficient. And in Afghanistan, you know, it was really 30 days, you know, that we saw these airstrikes and the, the battlefield was really, I mean, yes, there were bullets and bombs and people died, but it, it was over very quickly. And then the next thing you knew, there were people in Kabul flying kites and balloons and listening to music and shaving their beards. And it was very hard not to get carried away on that um, on that joy. But I remember thinking even then, and in the book, um, Dean and I have talked about this, I wrote that, you know, it, 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 it just felt at that point like things had happened too quickly, too easily, that it had all come together somehow too neatly, and war had actually been in this land for many years before America had ever come, and it would stay. And these weren't problems that could be solved with clean and precise military operations. Um, seeing, seeing what I saw in Baghdad, and uh, you know, I maintain my neutrality as a reporter. Um, I, I largely maintain my neutrality as a reporter because I was 25 and I really didn't know what anything about anything, so I was just reporting what I saw. And, um, but looking, you know, looking back on it now, now that I'm not a journalist and I can express my opinion, I, um, I, I can say, I and mean, it's really, it was a heartbreaking thing to, to witness. It was heartbreaking not just to see the wanton waste of human life, but also to see our government make so many small mistakes, you know, that added up to one really, really large morass of a mistake. And and it was heartbreaking. I mean, this is, you know, I guess people have said this is my generation's Vietnam, and I, I remember thinking at 25, like, well, it's the government. You know, they protect us. They take care of us. And then seeing just really sometimes just basic human errors and then sometimes, like, errors, lies by design that were executed um, by people who had actually thought it through and and uh, it, it was it was really heartbreaking for me just to, to see that. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to know you and your colleagues were shot at multiple times and you still managed to report and I just wanted to know how you maintained your composure and were still able to take notes and get the story in on time. Um, did I say I had maintained my composure? <laughs> <laughs> Lest I be misquoted. Um, no, I guess we did maintain our composure to a certain degree. Um, I think as a reporter, you learn to compartmentalize these things. You, you know, part of, part of this being brave thing is uh, people who do this kind of work, uh, there's a great deal of camaraderie in the field and, and there's really this belief or this kind of silent understanding that we're all in it together and if you complain or if you get scared, you're somehow letting other people down because you need to be strong for other people. Um, I think that is kind of partly what I learned it meant to be brave. It was to sort of carry the, the weight of the group and, and really um, keep the spirits of the group up because we were all in it together and we all got, you know, we all got there by our own volition. No one forced us to go, well, most of us, so. Tell the bat story. The bat story. So, um, you know, when I was in Fallujah, um, 
and again, you know, these were things that I couldn't complain about or cry about, you know, the being shot at, the rockets, the waking up in the middle of the night. Um, but then I, 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 there were bats in my bunker. <laughs> these bats that, you know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night. It's really creepy. They're like mice with wings and they would just be like, ee, 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 you know, and, um, and, and, and I, and I, and I cried, I cried about that. I cried about the bats because I could cry about that because that was happening to me. And it was like a problem that I could control. And it was an outlet for my fear. And it was something that I could call a soldier in to take care of. And um, how did I get the story in on time? You know, getting the story in on time was how you survived. If I wasn't there to write, if I wasn't there to report, if I was there, not there to witness and to write the story, then I was just a cowboy. I was just a voyeur, I was a leech. And I couldn't, you know, that to me was the worst possible thing that I could ever do. And so getting the story in on time, you know, my, my whole self-worth depended on it and so I, I didn't didn't feel like a choice to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you first uh, came back, now wait a minute, minute. You're in my class, and we never start with that. <laughs> I start with all the time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, when you first came back from Vietnam, mm -hmm. and you know, I when you first came back from the war, was it hard adjusting being back to like a normal life? Yes. Yes, it was very, very hard. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had PTSD, so I, uh, that was hard. I mean, there were moments of, like, really funny moments of joy where I'd be walking down the street and I'd be like, ooh, I'm going to Whole Foods, I'm picking up my dry cleaning, I'm a normal person. And, 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 it, and, and I hadn't been you know, a normal person for, for years, so these acts of, of normal, normalcy or, oh look, someone stopped at a red light, or, 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 or watching a couple, I mean, this is probably kind of creepy, but I, I would like, you know, I'd see somebody kissing in the street and I'd be like, ooh. <laughs> People are allowed to make out on the street here, you know, because that doesn't happen in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but but I, I, had, I had PTSD. I had, to, I had to get treated for it. I went to therapy and I had very bad dreams and all kinds of other things. And, um, and I just felt really alienated from, from, from people who lived here. And it was really hard for me to figure out what was real, you know, was, was this real? Is this life real? Is paying $4 for a cup of coffee, is that real? Or is getting shot at and, and, uh, and covering a war zone, is that real? What is reality? And, uh, and I decided that this is, this is the, 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 the reality that I wanted to, to live in. So, so here I am. I wonder, as a reporter, were you tempted sometimes to put in opinion, or were you just always happy to just be able to just straight report? Yeah, um, it's a it's a great question. Um, you know, opinion and objectivity or subjectivity takes place in many different forms, right? I mean, uh, the way that a reporter slants a story is not just by their opinion or inserting their opinion, it's by who they choose to speak to and what quotes they choose to color the story and even what story they choose to cover in the first place. Um, all of these things are your reporter's opinion. And um, additionally, you know, I worked for a news magazine. And so my job was a little different than a newspaper reporter's because I had to provide some kind of analysis um, not so much opinion, but I had to make sense of 
things in a way that went beyond straight, this is what happened and this is what happened. I had to say, this is what happened, this is what happened, and this is what it means. So I'm sure that at every single moment I was inserting some form of opinion, but my aim was always to, to be as close to the truth or truthiness. Careful. Word, yeah. <laughs> to be as truthy as possible and to, to really, um, you know, I, I, I've never really been interested in writing about politics or, um, for me it was about understanding the human condition. What did it mean to be an Iraqi at living in a war zone? What did it mean that you sent your school children to work or to school and then you had tanks barreling around the corner. Um, I really just wanted to understand what it meant to live there and how it felt to be there for them and to tell that story to people in America so that they would understand really what war is. Liz, have you got somebody back here? Um, okay, mercy. Uh, when you went back to Russia uh, and you were working for newspapers in Russia, how did you feel your rights as a journalist over there differed from your rights as a journalist working for an American publication? Well, I never worked for a Russian publication. I always wrote for American publications. Um, but my freedom to operate was, was greatly limited. And in fact, the first thing that happened to me, I, this is a story that I didn't tell, but um, so uh, as I was saying earlier, you know, my mom had said, you know, don't go back to Russia, you know, they'll think you're a spy and they'll arrest you. And I was like, yeah, right, mom, okay. And then of course I land in Moscow and on my very first reporting assignment, I'm arrested and accused of being a spy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, and, and had all kinds of crazy charges trumped up against me. What had happened was on my first assignment, I was working as a translator for Hong Kong TV, and um, they were there covering the International Olympic Committee. They were meeting in Moscow, and they were gonna choose the next Olympic city, and it was gonna be Beijing, and these Tibetan activists show up, and there are about six activists and 30 journalists, because there's nothing else going on that day. And so we're standing around in this big huddle, and, uh, and the riot police show up because it's Beijing, it's China, and it's Russia, and there's a very sensitive relationship between the two countries, and Russia doesn't tolerate protesters. So they send in the riot police, the same guys that they send to Chechnya with steel-toed boots and truncheons, and they wear striped shirts and black berets. They're really scary. And, and I'm standing there to the side because I, you know, these puddles, they make me nervous, so I'm like an easy target. They literally pick me up first, and this guy comes up behind me, and he starts dragging me across the, the lawn, and I'm screaming, I'm a journalist, I'm a translator, and, you know, kicking my feet. Say that in Russian. No. <laughs> 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 um, I, I do know how to say in Arabic, I'm a journalist, don't shoot. And where's the explosion, Wayne Entaba, where's the explosion? Also, I don't eat lamb. I like chicken. Okay. So anyway, so, um, so <laughs> these, are th these are things that, you know, you need to survive. You need to learn these things. So, okay. So, I'm, so, so they throw me on the, they take me to jail. They throw me on the bus. I'm arrested. I'm booked and uh, have to go to court the next day. And it, it was really amazing because I really got to witness um, from the inside all of the turmoil taking place in Russia and all of the changes that were taking place. Putin had just come into power. One of his first acts as president was to shut down NTV, which was the only really independent uh, television station in Moscow and in Russia. It was a national television station. And they literally, um, they came in one morning, they sent in these guys in ski masks. They closed the place down they took down the wall from, you know, on a television station, you'll have the uh, glamour shots of the anchors and the TV. They took them off the wall. They put new pictures up. And then they, and then they began to loop a Russian musical instead of the, the, the daily, the, you know, the morning news. This, is, this is, had happened maybe like a few weeks before I was arrested. And so every, everything in Russia was um, 
changing and, and, and people were saying that the way that Putin was going to assert himself was he was going to shut down the freedom of the press. So it was, really, it was a really frightening experience. And I joke about it now, I got arrested. Um, but at the time, you know, getting booked and thrown in a jail cell was, was terrifying. And the next day when I went to court, the judge asked this kid, this 18-year-old kid, he had peach fuzz on his face. It was a child, and he, she said to him, you know, didn't you hear that, you know, she was a reporter, that she was a journalist? And, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, well, she was screaming something about it, but by, by the time I understood what she was saying, we were so close to the bus that I just decided to put her on it and let my <laughs> superiors figure it out. It's like, really? Uh, so I promised you guys that we would be done in an hour and 15. We've got five more minutes, so let's try and make it a lightning round of questions. No more truth and beauty. Let's try and make some nice crisp ones. How often were you disappointed in the end result? Or did you ever find yourself in a position where you were disappointed with the end result of what was written? Like, you know, after your story had been edited or whatever, you know, the final product that was in a newspaper or whatever. Did you ever find yourself in a position where you're saying, wow, that is, that is not what I expected them to write? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you know, I had an amazing editor at US News and World Report. I was really lucky. Uh, Terry Atlas, who's my foreign editor, um, he's the best kind of editor because he went in with a razor. And we really talked about, you know, there's a great deal of thought that goes into putting together a story, everything from the quotes that you choose to does this adverb really belong there? And you'll have these conversations, you know, Three o'clock into the night, yes, there are people firing Kalashnikovs outside my window, and my editor and I are arguing about passive construction, um, <laughs> which sadly now my students bear the brunt of the... But anyway, so... Um, but, you know, I certainly, you know, as a freelance journalist, I worked for a lot of different publications, and working as a freelance journalist, you have a lot less control and a lot less power. Um, and I, I, I'm sad to say, but working for, um, you know, some of the magazines like... Um, I wrote a piece for a men's magazine called Best Life, and I wrote a piece for Jane Magazine, and some of these magazines, they would dumb down the stories in a way that I wasn't necessarily happy with or would not be proud to show to you today. Did you ever feel like you were being underestimated because you were a woman, that people thought you couldn't handle like the harsh conditions for such an extended period of time? Um... I did, and I said, bring it. <laughs> um, I had actually, um, one of my favorite quotes is a quote by Kafka, who said, in the struggle between you and the world, second the world. Uh, which means really, you know, don't make it easy for yourself, back the world. Yes, of course, a young woman, a young woman with long hair and too much energy and not knowing what she's doing. Um, and especially, you know, working in a, in a, uh, in a country in which, um, like in Afghanistan, for example, um, we, the, the few women who covered that war used to joke that we were like televisions because people would just watch us. <laughs> you know, you just, you walk, they, you know, they'd never, a lot of the men in that, in the areas where we were in the rural places in the country had never seen a woman who was not their relative and had never seen a woman interacting with other men um, but here's the thing, you know, you can't beat everyone, and someone, everyone has some disadvantage, right? A woman, a man, a young person, an old person, and there's always an advantage as well, and you just, you have to be who you are, and you have to work with what you have, and, you know, I said, I was jokingly saying bring it, but I actually found working as a young reporter, you know, in the moments where I tried to kind of prove myself, or sound really smart, those were usually the moments where there was just like crickets, <laughs> or like I just land on my, on my posterior. But the moments where I just accepted, okay, I'm young, and this person underestimates me, great, let them. Because they're not gonna see me coming, and they're gonna think, oh yeah, little girl, I can talk to her, and then they'll tell me all these things, and you know, that's, that's fine. I don't need them to like me, and I don't need them to um, think of me as, serious war correspondent. Um, let my writing stand for that. And um, I think you had mentioned, you know, working in, in, in Iraq uh, was really interesting. Sometimes um, 
especially as the situation got more and more dangerous, um, suddenly I found like men reporters, male reporters, were coming up to me and asking me to ride with them in the car. And it turned out that there was this theory going around that it was like safer to be a woman because if you were to pull up to a checkpoint, they would just more likely to, you know, wave you through. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, you know, came out uh, amazingly unscathed. Um, was I ever asked to pal around with Dan Senor in the green zone and get beers? No, but I didn't, I didn't need to, you know, I, uh, I did okay, so. Question. Uh, you say your career started out as an uh, act of rebellion and emancipation. What exactly were you trying to uh, free yourself from? Or who? What was I trying to emancipate myself from? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the burden of the history of my family and also, um, you know, my father, for all of his um, freedom seeking acts of dissidents and um, for all of his beliefs in human rights, you know, at home, he was a Russian dad. He was really strict. <laughs> and it doesn't matter, you know, what he said outside about freedom of speech. That didn't apply to his daughter. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, I grew up in a very strict, very conservative, very, um, you know, my father really believed that there was a, a right and a wrong, and there were a lot of rules in my house. And in some ways, this was, you know, this made it safe. You know, this is why people love dictatorships, right? You always know what's going to happen. You know that if you rebel, you know what the consequences are. You know what's right and what's wrong. Um, but I, I wanted to free myself of that. I wanted to, to realize myself and be my own person. And. Uh, I think that that's the reason why I did the things that I did because it was really important to me to stand on my own two feet and to to be known as Elana Ozernoy and not Leonid Ozernoy's daughter. So,